Hello. Oh my goodness, you guys. I I want to talk today about the stigma that's placed on lung cancer. And um Before I do that though, I do have a couple other things I just want to say real quick. So the first thing is I am completely amazed at the people who have reached out to me for various reasons. I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate the support and I'm hoping that I'm giving the support back. So there's that. Thank you so much. I, I appreciate it. You won't eat beyond words. Okay. The second thing that I want to say is as of right now, because I'm not that big of a YouTuber. I'm not some big influence or anything. On my YouTube channel, I have not gotten any hate comments yet. However, that doesn't mean I've never heard anything. And it doesn't mean that I haven't felt anything. Not outwardly obvious yet. Um, but yeah, so I got a couple things to say about the stigma on lung cancer and the first thing that I want to say is that um, anybody can get lung cancer smoking is not the only cause of lung cancer okay other things can cause it things that come to mind off the top of my head radon and uh, asbestos those things so then here's another one formaldehyde and I don't know, because I've been out of the beauty business for a long time, but I know I was in it for 20 years. And we had to have formaldehyde in our drawers where we kept, you know, brushes and things as a fumigant. And that's the law, or it was the law in Maryland where I was doing hair, okay? That was the law. So, you know, you can be exposed to things through your, your job or, you know, where you live things in the air there's a lot of things that can cause lung cancer and about 20% from what I've done on my research 20% um, of the people who are diagnosed with lung cancer never smoked okay never smoked so you know it's not just that it's not just smoking that's that's one thing the other thing is that smoking lung cancer is Smoking is not the only, uh, lung cancer is not the only disease caused by smoking, okay? There are other cancers that come from smoking, um, and it also contributes to heart disease and stroke. So, I, you know, my thoughts on it are this, okay? And I'm going to tell you a little bit of history about my life since I'm older, It's been said, you know, there was a lot of work done starting, I, I, I want to say in the 70s, with, it was almost like a conflict of interest, because you would see things on the TV about the American Lung Association saying, telling people to quit smoking, but then right after that, you'd see a commercial for cigarettes, like there was, <coughs> excuse me, that's not a smoker's cough, because <coughs> I did quit smoking, um, There was a lot of lot of marketing all over the place for uh, cigarettes back when I was growing up. And here's a little thing. Okay, so when I was a kid, you only had to be 16 years old to buy cigarettes. 16. 16. That was the magic age. Like, all of a sudden, doors started opening. Doors. Mm -hmm. Doors started opening for you when you were 16. You'd get your driver's license. You could drop out of school. That's great, right? And you could buy cigarettes. And cigarettes were 50 cents a pack. And if your friend worked at the store where, you know, they were selling cigarettes, you could buy them. They didn't, they didn't card people back then for, you know. I remember taking a note to the grocery store that my mother wrote so that I could get her cigarettes with her phone number on it. And nobody ever called to verify that, you know, these cigarettes were for her. 
you know, and then she'd say to me, well, keep the change or get yourself, a, you know, a candy bar or soda or something. Lord have mercy. So there was that. And then when I was talking about the advertising, so I, I'm not sure if they were still giving cigarettes out to soldiers by the time I was old enough to play around with that kind of stuff. But I know my father's generation, they definitely did. They were giving cigarettes to so soldiers. But from it, what I saw were that they were starting to market cigarettes to women. They were talking about, you know, women's lib was a big thing and becoming independent. And for some reason, they associated, or in our minds, you know, the marketers, associated smoking with being independent. Now going back like I was fortunate enough to know my great grandmother okay and so she was born in the late late 1800s like 1890 something I don't know but um you know she so she grew up in the Victorian Edwardian Edwardian age she was alive when the Titanic sunk all that kind of stuff when she was growing up a gentlewoman did not smoke okay that was something that a trashy woman did right so this marketing campaign on the people who were you know coming of age in the 70s and women who were becoming frustrated with their oppressed lives I'm just gonna say it like that it's not necessarily how I feel about it but that's the way it was presented um, <clears throat> They started marketing to women and telling them to get out in the workforce and you can smoke cigarettes and be independent, something that used to be a man's thing, right? So they were marketing to women, they were, there were cigarette ads everywhere, you were a Marlboro man, cool was marketed as like this jazzy kind of you know, cool, like, and associating cool, even though it was spelled with a K, with being cool, like the slang term, you know. I mean, it was just all this stuff going on, and it was very glamorized, okay? Well, then they changed the smoking age to 18. Now I think you have to be 21 pretty much everywhere to buy cigarettes, but they changed it to 18. Well, I could tell you that by the time I was 18, I was hooked. I was very well hooked, you know? And you could smoke everywhere. You could smoke on airplanes. You could smoke in movie theaters. They they stopped smoking in grocery stores before I started smoking. But I can remember my parents smoking in the grocery store. And they changed the law. And they told... Somebody came up to my father. Told him to put the cigarette out. And he stomped it out right on the floor. You know? I mean, it was like... And I know he was mad about it. But... You know, you could smoke anywhere, anywhere. Ladies used to smoke. Okay, so I was a hairdresser back then, right? I was uh, I was actually 17 when I got my license, and people would smoke in the beauty salons. That didn't, that didn't go away until like the 90s, I think it was, when they started making smoking in public illegal, right? And it was actually an OSHA issue. It wasn't, from my understanding, I'll just put it that way. These are things that... I'm not an expert, okay? Just keep that in mind. I'm telling you what I saw and what I heard. That it was OSHA that decided that smoking in public was a uh, health concern, a public safety thing. So, but yeah, I can remember ladies smoking while they were getting their hair done. Even getting manicures and smoking. There was a woman in the salon. She was one of those dirty smokers. Like, she smoked um, this... What was it? They were looked like cigars, but they were cigarettes. Not merit. I can't think of what the name is. It doesn't really matter. They were brown instead of white. And she would put them out in the manicure's finger bowl. She would put... Can you believe that? And we had a water fountain. It was an old-fashioned water fountain that was just like this square or thing. And it was away from the wall. There was a gap behind it. And she would put her cigarettes out in the in the water fountain and then drop it behind the water fountain. And one day we found a whole pile of them back there because she was like a weekly customer, you know. But, and there was, you know, people just threw cigarettes everywhere. And it was just a mess, you know. But it was everywhere. It was socially acceptable. And, um, 
It was everywhere. But at the same time, they were saying that smoking causes birth defects and that it causes cancer. And then, then they came out with um, the numbers or whatever it was that said that smoking is as addictive as the illegal drug that starts with the letter H because this is YouTube and I don't know how YouTube feels about that particular word but um, you can figure it out and we have an epidemic of that going on right now um, so I think what happened was the campaign to get people to quit smoking was actually good okay but um, <clears throat> because of that campaign it, smoking became socially unacceptable, okay? And, and there's a gap in public awareness of how hard it is to quit. And I can tell you, I mean, I've been trying to quit for 30 years and just finally, and I really haven't even quit, but there was a lady, there was a lady that I had, um, she was one of my cleaning customers and she had gotten um, a cancer and she used to be a smoker well now she she chews the gum she uses Nicorette or whatever and she chews the gum and she had made a comment when I was talking to her about it that technically she's still addicted to the nicotine but she uses the gum now here's another thing you know it's not the nicotine that causes cancer it's all the other crap that's in the cigarettes that's what causes the cancer not the nicotine and that's why I'm I'm vaping okay because I'm still addicted to the nicotine nicotine's what's addictive it's the crap that they put in the cigarettes for whatever reason I do not know why that causes the cancer okay Oh, good Lord. Anyway, <clears throat> this stigma, it's not just the society around us that, that is stigmatizing lung cancer, okay? That's one of the big things because that's your support system. You know, it's the people that you know. But it's also, there's two other places. And one of them um, is in the medical community. So, here's what I know about that. You know, they keep telling you to quit smoking, quit smoking. And here in the United States, they don't even want you vaping. They, in, in England, I had seen something on the internet by their cancer society or hospital. or I can't remember which website I was on. But they are recommending people vape. And there was a little blurb in there about um, vaping is actually safer in the UK because they regulate it. We're here in the United States. They don't. And there was some kind of illegal, the word they used was illegal. So it's, I'm thinking that they're saying it's illegal in the UK for whatever chemical it was that was in the vapes um, here in the United States that was causing problems. I don't know if that's still an issue or not. And I don't know what the chemical is. But the funny thing is, um, when I do buy my vape equipment, I look and see what's in the list of ingredients. And hopefully they're honest, you know, I don't know. I just know that I don't have the cough that I had before. And um, the other thing that has changed for me personally is I know that there was what they call crackling in my lungs. So when a doctor would listen to my lung, um, it sounded like crackling. And that's not there anymore. <clears throat> So, you have to do what you is best for you, is basically what I'm saying about that. But nicotine doesn't start cancer. And there's still some stigmati stigmatization, stigma, okay, in the medical community because I don't know that they necessarily are, are aware and it's not everybody, you know, you can't put everybody in a, in a box and say that everybody's the same. But in the community, there is still an issue of stigmatization. Even though, you know, from a clinical perspective, they know that smoking is not caused solely by, or I mean, lung cancer is not caused solely by um, smoking. And that lung cancer is just one of the many diseases that are caused by smoking. So, and, and then the other thing is research for lung cancer specifically is, is drastically underfunded 
compared to other types of cancer, okay? So, this is where I wanna bring something else into the mix. If you go back to the 80s and you remember when AIDS was first discovered or recognized, and they called it the, the gay cancer, that's what they called it. Well, then they started finding out that IV drug users were getting AIDS. And, okay, so at the time, please understand that I'm talking about what was going on in the 80s. Not now, okay? Um, that community was very oppressed. Um, we didn't have the compassion for drug abuse. And I think that's still a problem, too, to be honest with you. Um, people who you know are addicted to drugs something's going on there besides just the drug addiction itself okay and we know now that a lot of the people who are using that particular drug that starts with the letter H um, ended up on it because of some deceitful practices by the pharmac pharmacology um, industry that's another topic for another day but anyway the um, the gay community did something they started talking about um, they started talking about AIDS and so they, they started talking about AIDS and we started finding out that people were getting AIDS and HIV through blood transfusions which changed things so now if you go, I mean, I imagine they test it for a lot of other things, but I know specifically for uh, blood donation, you get you get tested for HIV because they won't take your blood if you have um, HIV in your in your blood, and and also organ donations. <clears throat> and then when babies were being born with it, you know, people were horrified that it was being passed in that kind of way. Well, you can't pass lung cancer from one person to another okay so we, we can take that out of the mix but the the big difference is that community we know they've been very outspoken about a lot of different things but their outspokenness has um, increased awareness of not just HIV but a lot of other issues that they have in their community they've advocated for themselves okay which brings me to me. Now, I'm conflicted within myself, okay? Because here's the third thing with this stigmatization is that I, I even stigmatize myself, all right? And I'm as I'm doing my research, I hear things that they're saying people didn't choose to, people don't choose to smoke. Well, I don't, I don't think that's 100% accurate. I'm going to have a conversation with my granddaughter here very soon because we have other addictions that run in my family and I want her to be aware of that. Um, you know, I was never forced to smoke a cigarette. You know what I'm saying? I, so, to say I didn't have a choice, that's not entirely true. In my opinion, that is not entirely true. I did it. Knowing that it causes cancer, my grandmother died of lung cancer. She was a heavy smoker, and it was not, it was not an unknown fact by the time I got around to doing it. So, I, I do, I feel responsibility for the things that I'm going through right now, and I think it's, it's not healthy, mentally healthy, I think to say, well, they, you know, it's not, it's they, they didn't choose to smoke. I, I don't think that's a true statement. But, I don't think people understand how addictive it is. And so, a lot of that's going to depend on the person and their personality and other things that contribute to addiction. And I'm not an addiction specialist or anything like that, but I know what it's like to be addicted to cigarettes. Um, so, there are other factors that play into that, but um, to say that that they they didn't choose to smoke, I don't think that's accurate. Okay, I don't I don't think that's accurate. At least not for me. You know, 
unless you want to say at 14, which is when I started smoking. Maybe you could say that because my brain was not fully developed yet, and you know, those kind of things, making bad decisions. And that's what it is. It was a bad decision. And I don't care what anybody says. It was a bad decision that I made as a child that's affected me my whole life, okay? Okay? And how come I made the decision to smoke and other people didn't? I, you know, some people just didn't like it or whatever, I, you know. But anyway, I don't want to go on a tangent on that. I, I am embarrassed by this, okay? I am truly embarrassed by this. And there's, like I've said in other videos, there's so little information on stage one lung cancer. And I do have people telling me to stay off of the internet, which I think is silly. I looked up um, Ron Woodruff this morning before I left for work today. And, you know, he was an advocate for um, the drugs to treat HIV. And he, this was before the internet and he would go to the library and different places to research what was being done and the drugs and so on and so forth. He didn't even have the internet, but he did go out and do his research. And, you know, so to tell somebody to stay off the internet, I think is, it would be like telling somebody, you know, 30 years ago, don't go to the library. If you want to learn something, don't go to the library. The internet is right there at our fingers. Yes, there's lots of bad information on there. Lots of false information. You know, so you have to be wise enough to sift through everything and double check your um, your sources, etc. But um, I'm doing this on the internet because I know I'm not the only person here who's going to be looking on the internet to find answers. Not that I have answers other than I think that we need to start talking about this more and, and I'm working through it just like I know there's got to be thousands of other people working through it or you know somebody who knows someone who's in my situation um, you know because most of us do not live in, in complete and utter isolation you know, we're somebody's mother, somebody's father, sister, brother, girlfriend, wife, boyfriend, all these different things. And so the people around us are also being stressed by this. They may not say it, you know, because they're trying to comfort me. But I know that there's people that are worried about me. I know that. I know. I know that. And and so, you know, we're. it's like a... It's like when you throw a pebble in a pond, you know, you start with one little ripple and it just kind of ripples outward. And, and so I'm hoping that the more that I talk about this, that the more other people are going to want to talk about it. And I am getting comments now. People are telling, you know, saying God bless, but people are also starting to tell me their stories. And um, that's what we need to do is start talking about it. It's painful to watch somebody die from a cancer that you can't say it's 100% preventable because like I said smoking is not the only thing that causes lung cancer and lung cancer is not the only cancer caused by smoking but I can guarantee you that lifestyle does make um, a difference as far as the probability goes okay and that's where where things lie. And just to, you know, okay, I smoked. I quit smoking. Not everybody's going to quit smoking. But that's in my past, okay? I didn't have lung cancer. I don't even know for fact right now if I have lung cancer because of where it's located. They can't do a biopsy. But I'm still living with the same kind of unanswered gap of time until I can go to the next appointment, you know what I mean? And so, I can't relax, I mean I can, I'm working on it, um, but this is a struggle and, you know, so I'm doing the best I can to take positive forward steps from where I'm at right now, today. I can't change the past, I can only change the future. Sometimes it's just baby steps, you know, but I'm doing
doing the best I can and that's that's why you know I'm doing these things I'm putting myself out there despite the fact that it's embarrassing and I, I do feel guilty about it I do there's no I'm not lying you know when I say that I feel horrible it's my fault and I'm putting people that I care about in a situation where they're nervous you know and worried about me but I just think we need to start talking about it in a more rational and compassionate way. First of all, so that so that we can get people out there to because here's the thing, it's a hindrance. I really did not know that I was going to have a nodule in my lung. If I had, I may not have wanted to take that um, that initial lung cancer screening. Because I may not have wanted to know, you know, of what, you know, they call it denial. It's denial. You know you did something, you know it causes a problem, and so you avoid it. And I think that's part of the thing that's going on with a lot of smokers who, uh, if they're aware, if they're not aware, we need to make them aware, right? If they are aware, they're not doing it because they're afraid to find out what's going to happen. And see, here's the thing. If I have it, because I'm actively doing what I can to... Uh, get it taken care of my chances of survival are higher if I didn't who knows what would happen in another three or four years I, it may be too late you know what I mean and even as it is now I'm not a hundred percent sure I just know that it's better to catch it early and so this is why we need to take the stigma away and stop shaming people for something that Maybe at one time they made a bad decision, but right now they're in a situation where they're, you know, dealing with an addiction problem. And remember, I told you the first thing that went through my mind, even though I had quit, when I found out that there was a nodule in my lung is I wanted to smoke a cigarette. And it was incredibly strong urge. Thank God I didn't do it. Thank God I didn't do it. But, you know, I've had to... Um, careful about who I hang around and things like that because just like any other addiction there are things that trigger trigger me and I want to smoke so you know we need to we need to be compassionate and we need to realize that anybody with lungs that's what they're saying anybody with lungs can get cancer and nobody deserves cancer okay so that's my thoughts on the stigma today to talk about and I just wanted to share that please you guys I'm going to tell you to do your research I'm not going to tell you to stay off the internet I'm going to tell you to do your research and share what you learn with people that you care about encourage them to get the testing if they need to and just be compassionate because trust me they know that smoking causes cancer okay they know that and so you don't need to shame them further what you need to do is help them move forward okay thanks so much i'm gonna get off of here and i will talk to you later Bye bye